All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the MSP Initiative Live. Today is January 24th, 2023. It is a Tuesday, and uh, I would say a great Tuesday because we're still feeling the love here in South Philadelphia as the NFL playoffs continue, and the Eagles sent the New York Giants home up the 80 miles up to the uh, 95 on Sunday, and uh, we're feeling pretty good because the 49ers are coming into town. Sunday afternoon, and uh, let me tell you, uh, it will be a gr- lovely 50 degrees, which is unusual for this time of year in Philadelphia, and that means it's a good day for tailgating. That being said, a little bit of housekeeping before we get too far into the show, uh, mspinitiative.com. I know initiative is sometimes hard to spell, but I promise you there's a website there. Uh, if you go to there, you'll see sessions, this session and every other session we've ever recorded will be there in both podcast and video format. So here, check out the sessions page. Uh, we'll be announcing community block parties uh, for the year in a little while. Uh, still cleaning up some fine uh, print and working with some of the other uh, folks in the sandbox uh, to you know line it all up. So stay tuned. You know, we all love those. Two live events this year, no more tour bus. So we're doing the MSP Community Minds. So save the dates, Dallas 8th and 9th and uh, in uh, Denver 14th and 15th. We're bringing in these and a bunch of other experts in to actually do workshop style uh, time with you so that you can actually walk away with something tangible rather than an idea that you never follow up on. And lastly, MSP Community Offers, uh, got a couple in here more coming but effectively uh vendors who have raised their hand up and said they wanted to throw something special out for the industry so uh, you can check that out on their community offers and that should bring us to the live session mike from dns filter how you doing today mike i'm really good and feel free to call me mikey it doesn't mikey. hurt my feelings okay <laughs> Sorry, I tried to go adult on you, but Mikey. You, yeah, you being from Philadelphia should be all about Mikey. Mikey, this. I mean, hey, you Mikey. Know, you know, I try, <laughs> I try to, uh, I try and not get too in too much trouble, or else I get beat up in the parking lot. You know, that's just how we do things here in Philadelphia. Where yet? Where are you at, Mikey? I'm actually in uh, near Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I like ah. to say, I like to say coastal South Carolina because either people have uh, never heard of Myrtle Beach or have heard of it and think it's a, a terrible place, which it, it kind of is. <laughs> Sorry, Myrtle Beach. I love you. Grew up here. Wow. I can say that. Got That's permission. a vacation spot, man. I know. So many tourists every year. It's great. <laughs> I mean, tour like that's their main like import export, right? Tourism. Yeah, I, I was on the beach yesterday morning filming a video for social media. So you know, it's and like it, it was a beautiful a bad, day. It's a bad place. Huh? You know, I, I shouldn't be complaining. What am I doing? <laughs> I don't know. I'd say that that's pretty nice. That you're number one. You have access to the beach, and that it's warm enough to go shoot a video there. But I digress. So um, talk to us yeah, again. We haven't had anyone from DNS filter on since, I don't know, I think 2021, if I had to guess, it's been a while. Um, would love to understand, you know, a little bit about what you guys are cooking up over there. Maybe a little bit about yourself, Mikey, for anyone that hasn't run into you out, you know, in, in the wild, um, you know, maybe a little bit about your journey, right. In technology land, you know, just to, you know, help kind of give us a little bit of runway into whatever's happening in your company. But uh, yeah, floor is yours, man. Sure. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, um, thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here on the MSPI. I, I understand you call it the MSPI, which is really cool. Um, my name is Mikey Pruitt. I am currently the MSP evangelist at DNS Filter. That really just means I'm responsible for making sure our MSP partners and uh, other partners have the the resources they need to be successful and not just successful with DNS filter, but successful as an MSP and in business in general. Uh, my my journey, uh, I'm not going to go on a diatribe about my history, but I've been dabbling in tech since about 2002. I think I built my first website right about then. And I've uh, I learned a lot along the way. Don't really have any formal training, but about four years ago, I started at DNS filter as a DevOps engineer. So I started on the technical side. During at that time period, uh, people wore a lot of hats. So I was like DevOps slash tier two tech support um, slash IT person, you know, a lot of uh, hats there. And that was a a great time. And since then, I was, I think I was employee number 13 
And Dean Esfolder has grown to nearly 150 employees. We have some really, really talented people. Uh, right now, we're really uh, honing in on using machine learning and AI to actually identify threats before they before the rest of the world knows about them. We've done a great job of that so far, and we are uh, ramping that up. Our labs team, they just changed their name to the labs team. Hopefully, they'll, they'll see this, and they're like super excited about it, but... Uh, it really fits the moniker fits because they're really uh, like mad scientists over there trying to figure out how to identify domains faster, how to identify other things uh, to protect people online from their DNS uh, traffic. Interesting. So, I, you know, number one, I think the MSP, you know, sandbox has known about something to protect for DNS related filtering for, for a little while now. Um you know, some people have come, some people have gone, some people have sold, some people have been acquired. Um, would love to understand where you sit in, in the bubble, right? I mean, talk a lot about security here uh, on the show uh, from a lot of different angles, right? Like we always hear about this layered approach. Um, is this still a, like an angle where people are getting hit? And, you know, it feels like, you know, with more and more of the kind of, you know, internet providers and, and all the people that are involved in, you know, DNS land, because by the way, it's always DNS, right? Whenever it's broken. Always. Um, so we're hearing a lot about encrypting of that traffic. Does, does that change your game? Does that prevent this from being, uh, you know, you know, filtered and secured properly? Like, how does that change the story? Yeah. When you go into like a DOH and stuff like that, there is, um, you know, things are opaque to us in those scenarios. So there are ways to configure DNS filter to work in those environments. It's, you know, relatively simple configuration. So it's not a big deal for us. Um, our, our customers appreciate that the, their traffic is encrypted. We encrypt it for them just like DOH would. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, like you mentioned, consolidation stuff in the market. I think it all kind of began with open DNS back in like 2008 or something. They were, they, they were, they definitely hit they, it hard. For sure. Yeah. And then the Cisco acquisition and actually a DNS filter got started because of that, because our CEO, Ken Carnese, was a MSP using uh, open DNS and became dissatisfied after that, um, after that purchase of the product and then kind of set out on a mission to make something better. I, I think he originally started looking for better things and there was not really much out there. Uh, so now, um, you know, we are trying to be that better alternative. And that was kind of his vision uh, coming into this. And the thing that we have uh, above the competition is that we're, um, like I mentioned, that labs team, like we are using machines to actually figure out the categorization of domains and threats on the internet, which can do it a lot uh, faster than any humans. Like we ingest all of the third-party security feeds that everybody else does, but we have an in-house uh, engine that's going around day and night trying to find those malicious uh, domains. Interesting. One of the main challenges back with that, uh, you know, again, you bring up open DNS, they definitely, like I said, kind of, you know, hit it and sold it, which is great. Congratulations to those guys that, uh, and now a couple of jobs removed from there. But, you know, one of the challenges was in order to get that service to work, you would actually have to install certificates on the machine separately, right? To kind of get mm -hmm. the pages, you know, with the, the, the overrides and, you know, some of the filtering aspects of that solution. How does that work with your platform, right? Like how much heavy lifting is there in order to get, you know, get that type of functionality? Yeah, it's very, it's very much the same. Um, all of the DNS filtering products have, have to, have to uh, deal with certificates like that, because if you think about what we're doing, uh, when you're making a DNS request and the response is coming in, we are essentially doing a man in the middle attack uh, to either send you that resource that you wanted or send our block page instead. So the system will work without the without the certificate, but um, it won't display that block page because that's the 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 certificate in conjunction with that block page is kind of what um, <clears throat> allows it in the in the modern web browser. So that's something that everybody has to contend with. Um, I It will work without the root certificate. So if you don't want to install, if you consider that a security risk, which we would, we would encourage you to just not do that piece and just realize that your uh, end, end customers are going to see a, a browser error instead of a block page. 
Something we have to deal with, but not really that big of a big of an issue. Yeah, I'm sure some of that could be automated, scripted. I mean, if anybody oh, you yeah. know, has their tools set properly set, you can probably do that in mass. Yeah, and uh, if you install our roaming client, the certificate actually comes with it. So it's there you all go. one package. Brilliant idea. We'll do it <laughs> once, and now you have both things. Um, traditionally, right, like when there are problems, right? <laughs> You know, a lot of end users are a little bit naive to like help on the troubleshooting process. You know, like one of the things that we, you know, we tell people to do as well, like turn it off, turn the service off in order to see if you're still having an issue when it comes to some of these DNS filtering approaches. Um, I guess like, is it Fisher price enough at this point where an end customer, <laughs> not, I wouldn't even call them end customer, end user of an end customer, you know, who like, you know, knows how to maybe use this and not much more you know, can like help diagnose if they're actually having a problem or if there's something that needs to be tweaked with your platform. Yeah. I mean, that is a, a concern. There's a lot happening with DNS. Uh, a lot of uh, devices are going to have multiple uh, like DNS servers on site. Like if they're at their office and then they go to a coffee shop and then they're at home, like these are roaming devices. So contending with those network changes is is uh, challenging and something we build into our kind of failovers into our roaming clients. Um, but the end user being able to service that is pretty simple if you want it to be. So like there are situations in very secure environments where if something is amiss with the DNS system, you just would prefer it not to work rather than fail over to something insecure. Yeah, no, I, I can understand that. I mean, listen, error in the side of caution, especially in today's day and age. Um, so, you know, I'm going to keep going back to OpenDNS because like they were they were in the beginning of the story. I mean, so, okay, of course, Cisco acquires them, right? And now they're part of this bigger story, although it's a little bit disjointed, right? I don't know if you, you know, you got the news that like, I don't know, like four months ago, everybody who was like a legacy you know, open DNS clients who have just been like, I all got a notice at once saying, Hey, listen, yeah. we're canceling your service. And it's like, uh, uh, okay. Like, do I go find something else? Do I, do I sign up for something? Is there a new SKU? Like what's the deal? And then like crickets, uh, probably not the best story, but bottom line is it kind of opened up the discussion of whether, um, you know, people should go out and look. Right. And of course, you know, MSPs love to shop on price and we all understand that, but you know, once you get past that, that, that point, it's about, Hey, how flexible is this? How easy is it to deploy? How easy is it to monitor? You know, a lot of people just turned it on, installed the agent, walked away, and then never actually looked at anything. Um, not that that's not the first time you've heard that story. So, you know, number one, is it, you know, is it price competitive? I hope the answer is yes. Number two, how easy is it in comparison to the tools from the past? And then number three, now that these newer you know, kind of SOC providers and like aggregation, like kind of platforms that kind of ingest all of the logs from all these different tools, you know, is your platform built to do something similar? Yeah, very similar. First, uh, you know, we, we definitely owe Cisco a thank you card for, for their uh, message that you mentioned. So thank you. <laughs> Probably could have been like, you know, you know, it's like, Hey, like you would have thought the message would have been, Hey, like there's a new SKU, please close here in order to like, you know, but they didn't do that. They just said, we're shutting off this lights. And then like, that was it. So yeah, guess you could send them a gift basket. Yeah. Send them a gift basket. But there, I think, you know, what you're talking about, there's a, there's really a conversation that needs to happen before that. And we've been uh, on a mission to educate our partners on the value of DNS layer security itself. So like, it's often um, kind of, you know, relegated to a back burner, like, yeah, like a nice to have type of thing. And we are, <clears throat> we are convinced that uh, DNS filter is such a large attack vector. And we do a, such an effective job of blocking things that we can mitigate many threats that you didn't even know DNS could, for example, uh, like business email compromise or whatever, they can uh, DNS filter and other DNS layer security um, products can block those those uh, malicious domains, even if those emails get through the spam filters or whatever. So this it's, and like you mentioned earlier, it's all about the layers. And the first thing we do is talk about the importance of DNS layer security. I think it was uh, last year <clears throat> we saw about, not we, this is a stat from public, I can get you the reference if you want, but it was about 68% uh, of organizations were hit with a DNS layer attack in the last year. 
So it's like more than you think. And I could have that number up. I don't have it in front of me, but um, it was, you know, very high. Everyone is experiencing threats via DNS. DNS was built um, way back in like the sixties, not with security in mind and security pieces have been bolted on over the years. Um, and, you know, there's new versions coming out. Like we've, we were looking at uh, quick that kind of Google has um, kind of championed and those protocols kind of have, uh, it's like DNS 2.0 really, but you know, it's been 50 years since DNS 1.0 has been out and that's what we are currently dealing with. Uh, so the DNS layer is very insecure. It's vulnerable. It's a huge attack vector. And that's really the first conversation that we have. And then we kind of walk into um, why DNS filter is the best uh, solution for you. And, you know, it's not always the best solution for every MSP. You know, I, I haven't met one yet that is not, <laughs> which I'm happy to field those questions. Um, but DNS filter itself is uh, above the rest, in my opinion, because of our um, uh, machine learning in the background and our labs team. Like there's, like I said, wizards back there doing amazing stuff, like looking for patterns so that we can predict which domains are going to be malicious in the future. Like this is like way above my pay grade kind of stuff, but it's great to see that they're working on it and they're uh, very diligent and excited um, about what that future holds. So after we talk about uh, why DNS filter is the best, we then kind of move to um, how DNS filter is a benefit to your MSP. And those are things like convenience, like managing our system is very easy. We have a multi-tenancy dashboard. We're set up for MSPs. Uh, we have white labeling. And then in addition to that, we have a lot of resources to get you educated on the system, how to use it for your technicians, and then also um, uh, help with sales. Like this is some stuff we're still building out, but we're really uh, ramping up our partner program to be more holistic, a holistic view of the MSP, uh, trying to give them all those resources that they need. And we realize that DNS, you know, DNS layer security is only one piece of that MSP conversation that they're having with their clients. So instead of, you know, bombarding them with a sales deck for DNS filter, like how to sell DNS filters, like here's the one or two slides that may help your MSP um, convince a customer that DNS layer security is important and they need to pay for it. And, you know, we would, we would encourage everyone to build it into their basic package and to use a package system, you know, to sell based on packages in the first place. But that's kind of uh, where we're trying to go with DNS filter and our partner program. Awesome. So <laughs> I, I got to bring it up because, you know, it's a question everybody asks, which is, well, if Microsoft has it built in the 365, you know, they have link checking and, a, you know, something, you know, that kind of along the lines of what you do, why go outside of that ecosystem to do something like this rather than just take whatever they give you? Yeah, that's actually, that's a perfect scenario. I, I did not prompt this, but you definitely teed me up really nicely. <laughs> well, by the uh, way, so this by the way just, just for the people that actually watch this, we never prepare before these calls. We just kind of show up and just talk shop. So these are all candid responses. Mark my words. Go ahead. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I had this conversation with uh, someone last week. They were looking for a new DNS or security um, and their customer was talking about, you know, it's already built into uh, WebRoot or it's already built into Microsoft Defender. And uh, he was like, you know, why, why pick DNS filter over the convenience of that? And I will say that it's hard to argue against convenience because that's very important to MSPs. And you can understand why, you know, in your position of, uh, you know, management overhead, like that like all matters products. a lot. It's average on average, the base package that you're talking about, right? Is like 40 to 50 solutions. I, it sounds crazy, yes. but when you start to actually put it together in like an Excel or a piece of paper, like you're like, oh, wow, it is actually that many. So it is like when you say, hey, they want it to be easy to manage. It's because they probably don't even there's have the 40 time or 50 things. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But anyway. Yeah. So like, and there's a trade off between um, convenience and security. Like I'm sure you've heard that too, but this, it, it really applies to the scenario because uh, while the DNS filtering piece features built into those other products may filter DNS, are they the best at it? And that's really 
the argument that we have. We, you know, we believe in our solution. Uh, we encourage others to test us, um, you know, pick a domain, you know, it's malicious, test it. Um, <clears throat> I can give you a story in a second, but, uh, you know, that security versus convenience trade-off, is it worth it to put your clients at a slightly higher risk uh, to use the convenience solution versus adding that one more product DNS filter in this case? So let's hear the story. I got a story for you. So, yeah. So DNS filter, the story last week, I gave a um, kind of a lecture to a local, local school, middle school and high school age students. And I actually have a, I'll have a video coming out tomorrow. If you want to check me out on the socials, uh, I am uh road to CISO, <laughs> like trying to get there road to CISO on like, most of the social like media. I'm platforms. coming after you, Matt Lee, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I was invited, you know, as a cybersecurity expert to uh, teach the students on, you know, whatever, they didn't really care. So I picked phishing emails and I set up a whole phishing scenario, like a real life scenario uh, where they, I had some fake box, empty boxes of fun stuff like Xboxes and iPhones and MacBooks and, you know, kind of insinuated that these were up for grabs for a winner and used a website to collect their email, which then on a delay triggered an email, a fake email from one of their teachers, um, which had a link in it to go to a portal that looked just like uh, their student portal. And I used, um, what is it, SE tools, social engineering toolkit to actually build all this. And it was like so easy. If you didn't know, building a phishing website is so easy. Anyway, so this was on a, a Sunday night, 11 o'clock. I, you know, the website was there. I was like, yeah, okay. It kind of, it works. It's good. And, you know, I have like three days to like tune it up if I need to. So the next morning, Monday morning, I am looking at it or I pull it up to you know, like start testing stuff and it is blocked by DNS filter. And I run DNS filter and I'm like, oh my God, we blocked our, I blocked my website. So I go in our, uh, our um, dashboard and see like when it was blocked and it was 1 a.m. in the morning, DNS filter blocked this, you know, fake phishing domain that I had just set up. So two, within two hours, DNS filter knew that domain was malicious or phishing. Wow. Yeah. So that's I was kind of like, cool. well, that's, that's a pretty good story. I mean, speed is important <laughs> on this stuff because you just, you know, I've heard tons and tons of stories where people like set up the domain and then like hours later, it was already taken down and they're moving on to the next guy, right? Like, yeah, and that's they what they like do. Set they up don't... these phishing scenarios as they're targeted. Exactly. The, the bad guys are not slowing down for us to catch up. So we have to be fast. We've actually found that uh, DNS filter catches threats about seven days before the competition. This would be like we identify a threat and then the third party feeds that we ingest or like virus total don't pick it up for like five to seven days later. Wow. It's a lot so, slower than you would hope. So that's that that's the, those are the arguments against convenience versus security, adding that one more uh, product DNS filter to your security stack. Interesting speed. No, that's a good, uh, that's a good story. It's a good argument. I had a guy <laughs> who was trying to play a prank on this other guy that apparently he hangs out with uh, at the country club, not my scene. <laughs> and um, he's like, yeah, he's working at this law firm. And like, I want to, I want to like get him good. Cause like, I guess they like prank each other. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, but I want to send him an email to make it look like it came from his company when like, it's not. And I'm like, I'm not telling you to do something wrong because that's not me. I was like, but you know, just take their domain name and like put a dash in and like mm -hmm. buy a domain. I was like, I bet you it'll work. It did work. <laughs> he went and did it. I didn't tell him to do that. He that he just took the idea and ran with it. But um, he did. He he put a he put a dash in there. There's yeah, a typo. That's what I that's what I and used he too. Totally got him. I actually swapped out a W for two V's in my domain. <laughs> It's just, it's, it's so simple, right? I call them cousin domains, right? It's like, you can't tell. And like, um, somebody had brought up in a past call that like, somebody had sent an email out of the PayPal system that came from PayPal, but embedded in the, in the email was the malicious link. Yep. Like as if you were sending a message between seller to buyer or something, right? So you, you think it's legit, but in reality, you're actually going to a bad place. So like, you know, I didn't hear of SE tools before, but if it's that simple that a toolkit's out there and you can just fire it up, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's very hard for anybody with even minimal computer skills to actually, you know, 
mimic the bad guy, right? Yeah, exactly. And and they're a lot more sophisticated than what I did. You know, and they're that's what what they're doing is they're you know you take PayPal for example. They're, they'll send out millions of emails that look like they're from PayPal, and you may get that email and be like, I don't even have a PayPal account. Well, they don't care. Somebody they sent the email to will and will potentially click that link and you know it's, enter it's like some sensitive thing, info. Right? Exactly. You, like, you, but now they're not just doing that. And maybe this is not what your product is, but like, so they're doing that now with text messages. Yeah. Right. They send them out. They're like, Hey, AT&T, your bill didn't get paid. And you're like, Oh my, I'm not on AT&T. Why am I getting this like, text message? <laughs> but like people actually click on those and it's like the same thing yet in SMS format. Yeah, absolutely. So phishing comes in all forms like um, uh, email comes from all message types, text messages, social media requests, uh, even phone calls like that. Those could all be um, bad actors, you know, posing as a legitimate source. So you have to be vigilant and DNS filter and DNS filtering can stop anything that has a link in it that goes out to the Internet. So any Internet connected device would benefit um, from something like DNS filter. And we have Remy clients for iOS and Android. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. How does that work? Not, I mean, not, it works just the same as our as our desktop clients. You, ha you have to have a supervised iOS device at the moment, which okay. can be contentious for some people. But if it's, you know, if it's a business environment and you're providing phones, they're typically in uh, supervised mode, mode already. And then you just say, I want this software with this key. And that kind of identifies that person, which can then, um, you know, configure the policy that's meant for them, which yeah, in, I'm looking, in, I would in say those it's cases, right here, it's right here in the app store. I'm actually looking at it right now. Yeah. Very nice. I, I mean, <laughs> that, I mean, honestly, I didn't even think to ask a question because like most people, the answer is I don't have it, but you do. Yeah. I mean, you have to cover all platforms. So like, you know, we're like enterprise great, great security at a, you know, slightly less, less, a uh, smaller budget. And I, you, you asked earlier kind of what the pricing was and um, you know, our retail pricing $1 is million. $1 million. <laughs> yeah. So the basic package is like uh internet, I'm sorry, network deployment only style. That's a dollar per user. And then if you want to add on the um, desktop roaming clients, Mac, windows um, and Chromebooks that jumps up to a dollar 80. And then Chromebooks. The, yeah, Chromebooks too. So we have a, a lot of education extension? customers. Yes. And okay. it uses DOH. <laughs> ah, I see. And then if you jump up to our enterprise plan, that's when you get the uh, uh, the mobile roaming client access. But you can uh, get the mobile, mobile um, clients for like an additional fee on the pro plan. There's a few other differences between the plans, but it's basically like one, two, and three dollars, depending on your needs. And MSPs get a discount off of all of that. I'm sure they love to hear that discount. Yeah, that's good. that's how you you know make you can make money with DNS filter. Okay, so you sell. So there's so somebody could technically buy direct, and then obviously have the kind of MSP program all, you know over here on the other side. Um, is there any minimums to the program? Like, is there like bronze, gold, silver type thing? How does it work? Yeah, you can um, sign up for monthly or annually. You get a you know a bigger discount if you go annual. Uh, we have a fifty dollars minimum for all the plans, and it's kind of automatic uh, in our partner program. Kind of how you progress is based on basically your spend level. You know your mm -hmm. tiers one, two, and three, uh, based on your spend level, and that kind of determines your discount, either uh, twenty, thirty, or forty percent off of retail. Okay, cool. So it sounds like it's not a you know unreachable minimum fifty dollars a month. I would hope would be, you know, pretty reasonable even for a really small guy. Okay, and then is there like a multi-tenanted portal so that they can manage all their accounts in one place, or they got to go one by one? Yeah, there is a multi-tenancy dashboard. Uh, when you sign up for the partner program, you automatically get uh, elevated into that, and you can divide up your your instance by organization so you can manage them individually. However, there are some kind of global features uh, that we recently launched. There's like universal block and allow lists. So like if you set up one block list in one place, it will trickle down to every tenant that you have, every policy that's in the account. And that just makes management easier. You know, in in the situations where we have to convince people that Security is more important than convenience. We have to make it as convenient as we can. 
<laughs> to overcome those objections. Hundred percent. You, you you say that until like you know the CEO is on his computer at eleven o'clock at night and like you know they can't go somewhere, and then like you know the angry Gan the an angry Graham comes out of that saying why can't I use my computer? <laughs> yeah, I wonder and what the CEO is doing that late at night. <laughs> uh, that's a good You're question. Like, but yeah, you can have a policy that's it per like per person. You can have a, po a policy per person, per, per group of people, per like department. You could even set it up via like your VLANs in the office. You could have it arranged that way or via like your active directory groups. You can assign policies that way. So you make it easy. And if you were to make, wanted to make a change, like say the CEO was trying to get to a website that was blocked by, you know, whatever, um, filtering that you had set and you decided that no one or everyone should have access to that to that site you just go to the one place the universal allow list add that domain and now everyone has access and you, if you're familiar with domains you know that um, some domains kind of uh, redirect or are kind of masks for others so when you're adding a domain um, it will kind of detect that and say do you want to add all of these other c names so that you can go ahead and I allow literally to... was just about to ask about C names because like a lot of the platforms when you're you know trying to brand them right like to do the whole C name thing but there you go your system already is, is like designed to capture that yeah we thought of a lot of stuff and we you know originally we modeled ourselves on kind of what was the pieces left over from open DNS but since then we have um, you know, progress leaps and bounds over most of the competition. Like there's a lot of great solutions out there, um, but we like to consider ourselves the best and we are happy to entertain your objections for it, convince you otherwise. <laughs> oh. Okay. That's interesting. I love, I love, I love a challenge. You ask the <laughs> people that uh, hang around me, I'm all about the challenge. Um, what do you, here's an argument that comes up, you know, what, you know, because it's always DNS. What happens if your DNS servers break, right? Like you have some sort of outage and now all of a sudden, you know, all that traffic stops working because it's going through your servers rather than, you know, public DNS servers. Has that ever happened? Uh, that's never happened. We have a, just like all the other DNS providers, like the big ones, like Cloudflare's 1.1.1 or Google's 8.8.8. .8 .8. Um, you know, they use Anycast network. Uh, just like we do. Uh, there's a few other DNS providers that do this. Some of them uh, do not. I won't mention them by names, but some of them are like a server in an AWS data center somewhere. So like if that data center is in Las Vegas and you have to go to uh, London for some business trip, you are D your DNS traffic is going back to Las Vegas and then out to whatever resource on the internet you're trying to grab. Well, with Anycast, uh, what you're doing is you're connecting to the nearest node and uh, we have nodes all over the world um, and all the major cities anywhere we can get our get a, our hands on a server we are putting a node there and multiple nodes so that when they fell over um, you know and they do fail like all the time but there's others to pick up the load and other cities nearby that can pick up the load too so it's a very um, balanced system and, you know, I mean, even Cloudflare and things like that go down. But it, if you pay attention, it's usually because someone hit the wrong key or, you know, it's basically like something kind of dumb when they kind of dig in. It's it's rarely like some catastrophic, catastrophic event. It's like, oh, we tried to patch, like patch Tuesday. And, you know, somebody fat fingered a dash instead of an underscore or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's amazing that it's that fragile. But it, it is hard to bring down any cast network. So, like, we have uh, more than one any cast network. So we have two that are, you know, balanced, just like the, what I mentioned, and they will fell over to each other. So if one of them totally goes out, uh, the other uh, completely separate network will pick it up. That's kind of like when you're and you're setting the DNS uh, resolvers for your machines and you put in the two IPs, mm -hmm. those are the the multiple Anycast networks of that service. And we do just the same thing. Cool. Well, that's good to know. Um, I guess the big, the big picture is, you know, one question I asked earlier, I'm going to bring it back again, right? So now everybody's been going down sock lane, I guess, um, you know, picking you know, either creating internal teams, I'd say that's probably the minority or finding an outside vendor to kind of, you know, be that kind of monitoring type service, right? To kind of keep your eyes on all these things. Do you, 
partner and their work? And or does your system allow the, those logs to be pulled in via, I don't know, an API and, you know, so that those third-party services can monitor traffic? Yeah, absolutely. So that's very important. So one of, one of the things about, you know, having a security stack is monitoring that security stack. It's like crucial. Like if you don't know what's happening, um, then you don't know where to respond and when to respond. And even more, more importantly, you, you, there's no uh, prediction occurring to identify patterns that may become malicious in the future. Like if you're talking about mostly like a, like a SIM or something like that, and we can export our data to a SIM, there is an extra fee for that particular feature. Uh, it's like a per user fee. I think it's 25 cents per user. But, you know, for your larger organizations, they're really looking to correlate our data, the DNS data, with other systems they have, like Microsoft Office 365, like, you know, somebody logged in here, their DNS traffic is going there, and then their, their uh, you know, location. And you can correlate all this information and say something is wrong. You know, like there's a... The laptops, the account says that it's in Bangladesh or somewhere, um, but they're logging into Microsoft 365 from California. And it's like, whoa, something is wrong here. And correlating all that information is where you can uh, put us in to threats before they actually become events. Cool. Well, good to know that it's there. It costs a little bit more, but you know, you're not you're not on an island, which is important. Um, yes. Any integrations back to like, you know, the normal players when it comes to like PSAs and billing and like keeping track of quantities, because, you know, that's where people usually like they pop up and they're like, oh, yeah, we didn't bill properly for a long time. <laughs> yeah. How does that <laughs> yeah. work? Yeah. So our, uh, you can easily add users and take them away in our dashboard. But like you kind of alluded to, the the important piece is to be able to do that somewhere else. And we just respect what you tell that system. And we're really working hard on that. We are actually in a beta right now with PAX 8. So if there's any uh, PAX 8 listeners out there, we are going to soon be available in the PAX 8 store to everyone. There's already a, probably like 10 or less customers using it as a beta to make sure everything is working smoothly before we uh, kind of launch it officially. I don't know if I should have said that, <laughs> but whatever. And then we're, uh, it's very close. And then we're working on other um, integrations just like that, because we know that, uh, you know, these convenience trade-off that we kind of been talking to kind of keep, keep but butting their heads up. Um, that's one of them. Like if DNS filter is going to be less convenient that you need one more product, we need to be more convenient in other ways, like uh, integrations with billing. And I think our next kind of target for the PSA and other marketplaces is uh, probably ConnectWise Manage. Mm -hmm. And we also have a team working on distribution deals uh, internationally and um, in the U.S. to have distributor uh, availability through lots of different marketplaces. Like we don't, awesome. we don't care where you buy DNS filter. We just want you to buy it. <laughs> no, I get that. I get that. I'm trying to just be easily accessible to Amazon. Absolutely. Um any tie-ins to some of the other products out there, RMM or, you know, any sort of, you know, there's network app monitoring out there. I mean, Microsoft has Intune for their stuff, like any other tie-ins from an integration standpoint. Yeah, we, we expect uh, the deployments of our roaming clients, especially to always be done with RMM tools. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't, um, we make it very easy. Like we have command scripts or whatever that are, you know, easy to copy paste and add it to your Intune system or your ConnectWise RMM. ConnectWise has like two or three RMMs, I believe. I, I know. Yeah. It's starting to get a little confusing, I think, but yep, they do. But yeah. We expect that. And we, um, we try to make that easy as well. Cool. Um, any concerns with too many, like I would, your argument's going to be, I'm sure we're the best, so we don't care. That's fine. But like, do you feel like this particular line item in the stack of 40 or 50 items is starting to get crowded or or do you think that there's you know plenty of room to grow you mean for like dns or security yeah yeah i think there's a lot of people that have um kind of as i alluded to earlier think of dns filter as like an add-on like a nice to have type of thing and i don't think they've really thought it through like you're using dns right now all of us on this call are everyone watching this call we're all using dns um, we've, we've see about between 5,000 and 9,000 DNS queries per day for like a business style user. Uh, so that's, you know, 
potentially 9,000 vulnerabilities that are happening all day. And you, you absolutely want a piece of security that is between that connection, making sure that the domains that you're going to are legitimate and you're where you're supposed to be. Yeah. No, I don't disagree there. It's definitely, uh, even the big guys <laughs> have to have to have it, you know, something in the, in the conversation. But again, usually when there's a problem, that's the first thing that breaks. I mean, uh, you know, it's not always nothing, Teams. right. Microsoft teams, right. Just went down a couple of days ago. Right. For like half a day. Right. I mean, you know, we've seen back in 2022 and, and prior you know, to that, right. Every, all the big guys always run into some issue, right. Whether it's AWS, Google, Azure, somebody has a problem somewhere. And then they go back and to your point, it ends up being, oh, well, you know, like, did you notice that like two weeks ago, like the FAA had to ground all flights? Yeah. And they were like, oh yeah, the database needed to be like <laughs> rebooted. Like we rebooted a, a and I was like, 40 year old piece of equipment. <laughs> wow. I was like, <laughs> I'm still whole country's airline tracking system on something that's that, you know, yeah. you know, I would say easy to have a problem. That's a little bit uh, concerning. Yeah, we had a little debate on was that a some type of cyber attack or was it just um, stupidity? And we're still on the fence. I, I, I mean, they, they say it was just admit it was that it was, it was an just, attack. But it, somebody actually pointed me to a couple of articles that like this is not the first country that's had almost the same exact thing happen. I think Canada had a problem uh, at the end of 2022, and then I think another country overseas. I don't know if it was like Philippines. Like this is like an attack vector. I think. Where they're like trying to like you know <laughs> ransom the airline traffic uh, over countries, right? Which, like I said, I, I don't know if any of these countries would ever actually admit it, but that's scary that it's that old or, or that not resilient uh, that they haven't actually like tested the DR plan. Yeah, if if uh, the hackers really want to go after very large targets, they should start learning COBOL. <laughs> It's funny that you should say that a uh, buddy of mine I went to college with works for a financial, like a banking company that does a lot of, has a platform for stock trading. And he was saying that almost all the banking systems, at least in the United States, are based off of like AS400 technologies, ancient, 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 but it's been, every, every bank has one. Like if you're starting a new bank, you still buy one of these things. It's crazy. Because apparently <laughs> the language is so old. Like- they're hoping that that makes it hard to hack, right? So like when you have to interface really new technology, right? Like the apps and the, you know, you take a deposit with your phone camera and all this, whatever, like the layer in between the cool new stuff and like the actual calculator that's saving all of the information is in this COBOL language. It's like, there's not enough people that actually know the language. And like, it's like, it's like a Rambo you know, kind of situation where like they get paid stupid amounts of money to get these projects done because there's just not enough people out there that know how to write it. Yeah, it is. It is a bit frightening on the the old technology that most of our world runs on the in the most critical systems that we have, airlines, yeah. banking. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, hmm. makes you wonder, you know, in 2023, why like things haven't been you know, thought about in that way, but then, Hey, we're all at the, at the low end of the totem pole, right. And small, medium business land, we're all like having to like deal with all these things that are potentially coming down and regulations and this, that, and the other, but like the guy sitting at the top, <laughs> look in the mirror guys, you guys had the same problems at a much larger scale. A um, couple other questions on the way out the door compliances. I know that that's starting to become a popular conversation, although I just saw on a couple of uh, threads that uh, CMMC, which seems to get brought up all the time, because I guess that's what you're supposed to have to deal with when you're dealing with government uh, vendors, contractors, whatever, apparently it's gotten pushed <laughs> to like 20, you know, to a, 2024, 2025. I thought that was interesting that like, hey, you know, we're trying to set the standard for everyone, but oh, by the way, we've pushed it now. Um, in interesting, but are you running up into a lot of compliance type questions? Uh, and if so, what are the more popular ones that seem to be popping up? Yeah, com compliance is going to be pretty big in the you know this year and in the in the in the coming years. Uh, we've we've seen uh, like insurance companies, people trying to get cybersecurity insurance, like they have a checklist. Um, there's a CIS um, checklist, and and 
a lot of those kind of are kind of coalesced together. Like there's all these checklists and you're like, do I meet all these things? And if you don't have DNS filtering, like they actually call out DNS filtering generically on almost all of these checklists. So it's a layer that you have to have um, if you want to be, you know, insured or you want to work in government. And, you know, it's, it's up to you to figure out which vendor is right for you, which, which is the best solution for you. And it's a challenge for the MSPs. Like that's something that we we're working on now is to like educate MSPs on all of this uh, nonsense, uh, you know, insurance and compliance. And, you know, you don't have, um, you know, an extra two days for, for this week to go read, read those laws that are coming out. Um, but we do. So we have experts that are going to read them anyway. So we're having them, um, you know, write a synopsis so that we can then relay that to our customers and kind of get them ahead of the curve on what they need to do to be, to meet those compliance needs. No, that's since she's only getting more, not less. Right. Let's be honest. Um, we're going to see, I'm sure on out on the road, right. I mean, you guys like to be, you know, at some of the more popular kind of industry events. So, you know, and I think you guys were, were helped us uh, in a couple of things in 2022, you know, kind of, kind of joint vendor things that we put together. So we really appreciate you guys for jumping in on some of those. We love collaborating with everybody in the sandbox to make really cool things happen <laughs> sometimes. Um, I wish it was easier, but sometimes it gets harder. Um, any trends for this year that you think are worthwhile mentioning, right? Big picture, zoom out 30,000 feet. Um, anything that you see coming down the pipe or any prognostications in MSP land that you think might be happening? Well, I'll, I'll steal a few predictions from our um, security team. One of them was uh, AI will become a real threat. Uh, and that would take the form of artificial intelligence in impersonating humans to trick you into stuff. Uh, you know, they mm -hmm. may they may call you on the phone and sound just like a person um, and then go, you know, get you to go to Walgreens to buy an iTunes gift card or whatever they do. But, um, you know, things like uh, artificial intelligence are going to be part of the security uh, or the, you know, the attacks uh, vectors that we see will so, start so a lot incorporating more people AI. are going to use chat GPT to try and trick you. Yeah, chat GPT. But, you know, the hackers will have their own version that no one knows about. And they may be able to, steal the code behind uh open ai's chat gpt so you know hopefully hope, hopefully open ai has good security on their github repos yeah i hope so let's let's hope that yeah but they're they're already seeing that people are starting to use that in malicious ways right it's okay yeah, regard, ransomware <laughs> yeah and in regard to like uh msp trends i'm i'm I, and i heard you mention this on one of your previous podcast, I think it was the most recent one with uh, Cronus, you were talking about uh, the economic environment that we may be seeing in the future. Like we're all kind of hoping that the predictions are not as accurate as some of the news <laughs> organizations make them sound. But if there is, is a situation where, you know, environments are constrained, budgets are constrained, that's going to hit MSPs pretty hard. And I've been uh, trying to figure out what does a consolidated security stack look like like you mentioned you have 40 products that you have to attend attend to like what are the five that are vital that you cannot let go of uh in a budget constrained environment what are what are those are all 40 of those necessary so like those are the kind of things that we're we'll out to be thinking about um in the msp land in the coming months hopefully not but <laughs> could you imagine going from 40 down to five I mean, in, a really like those five must be just mission critical. What would your five be? I'll tell you mine. What would my five be? What would your? Let's 40? just not. Let's say not product, but um, category. Category. Yeah. Well, you you can't run away from either Microsoft or Google, right? So they're somewhere in the mix. I mean, you know, got to get email and collaboration tools. Um. Got to have something around mobility and remote access, right? I mean, hybrid working's not going anywhere. I, I mean, I've been doing that for 
20 years, I feel like I don't forget the pandemic. I was working out of my trunk or out of an airport in 2010, 2005, 2015. Uh, so that's one. Um, man, I mean, I don't know how you can take a stack of 10 or 15 or 20 security products and narrow it down to one, but you're going to need to have some sort of, um, you know, like, Everybody's like, oh, XDR, all this, whatever, right? Like just the evolution <laughs> yeah, right. of some sort of endpoint software that yeah. from a security standpoint, um, obviously you're going to say DNS is in there. It's fine. Um, <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> of course. Uh, I'm trying to think big picture. Um, hmm. Now I'm I'm thinking between like because remember a lot of that stack of forty to fifty, the actual end user doesn't see right like yeah all the tools that back almost end none of them right so like I'm trying to think of the stuff that the actual end customer of the MSP interact with on a day to day basis right you're never gonna get rid of the computer in whatever format it's in right I don't care whether it's a tablet or a laptop or a desktop like that's never gonna go anywhere and. But now I'm thinking about the tools that they use, right? There's got to be some sort of file sync, share, storage somewhere, right? I don't, whatever. There's a lot of different ways to get there, but the files got to be somewhere, right? And there's got to be a backup of those files somewhere. So like A and B, right? Kind of come together. Um, yeah, I mean, I could go on. I actually, like this is a very, we could probably do a whole session on, if you had to consolidate down to a handful of categories, what would they be? But yeah, yeah the, that's, that's the, off the top of my head, right? I'm like, I, I probably need to spend like a good 30, 45, 50 minutes just going through and saying, can we do without this? What would the end customers, you know, kind of feeling be if we took yeah. this piece out? Would they even know? Yeah, and, and I was kind of focusing on, I was doing this exercise myself and trying to think of, you know, focusing on security only uh, because like the other stuff you mentioned, like backups and uh, folders, you know, file storage, like that's, you can't get rid of that. You have to have something. <laughs> so, so I was cheating. And since I'm in cybersecurity, I'm going to, I was focused on that. And my categories were identity, which it would include things like a password manager, MFA, and like, a, um, uh, you know, access client. I'm thinking of things like Okta type of stuff. Yeah. There's so, so many identity. people who don't have a password manager. I would argue the last oh, people out there are probably not very happy about their situation. Um, MFA, we hear about all over the place, but still so many people haven't turned it on. And then, um, identity is kind of tied into it, right? Right. If you actually progress the story, I would argue that while you're saying you have to have them, so many people out there that in one of the three things you just mentioned have nothing. That's that's not good. <laughs> it's like oh, the trade off oh, between security and convenience, like the the passwords and MFA, like can prevent so many things. <laughs> I I agree, thousand percent, but it's still like over fifty percent. That's my pr pr prediction. I'm sure. Wow, we can go out there and find the answer, but like, I still think there's a majority of people out there that just haven't turned them on. Like, and by the way, and I mentioned it in the past call. They're not being forced to turn it on. It's something you actually have to go and press the button. Mm. Right? Like, why does Microsoft not, you know, when you go to sign up for the first time? Or yeah, you actually, or a lot of, a lot of uh, pr uh, products do allow enforcing MFA. We actually do that at DNS filter. And you would think we, that this is now just standard, right? You don't have to you, actually yeah. go and actually do something to turn that on. Yeah, that's another interesting concept is like, we're actually a lot further behind than a lot of us think because we're all very close to it. So there's like, there's still the easy work, the easy low hanging fruit stuff that needs to be done. Um, because, you know, they, they're just uh, behind in security. That's really all it boils down to. All right. So you said a combination of identity, MFA, password. Yeah, identity. So that's a uh, category. What else you got? Uh, DNS, of course, just like you predicted. And this could be kind of expanded into like egress traffic, you know, uh, uh, network uh, security, you could call it. But I specifically say DNS because I have an ulterior motive, of course. And then endpoint security, just like you mentioned, you know, the fancy acronyms, uh, EDR, XDR, like Next I kind of bundle this. 
point, yeah. whatever you want to call it. I kind of think of this as just like um, modern firewall or, I mean, antivirus or next generation antivirus. Like it's kind of similar, but it's better. I think it's just like the five-year-old way to say it, a fifth grade language. So Bruce, la- Bruce, Bruce, by the way, thank you, Bruce, for that. I'm going to save this link. It says, I found a website that says 89% don't have MFA in it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Now I feel a lot better. Go ahead. And the last one. Uh, monitoring. Like oh. if you don't know what's happening, if you don't have visibility, you, you're not going to be able to find things before they happen. And you're not going to know where to look after they happen. Yeah. I think that if I had to tell you right now, and maybe Bruce will come back to me with the link for this one later on, but I would say a large majority of MSPs do not have a consolidated monitoring solution in place for, I'm not even gonna say all their products, the uh, majority of what the tools that they're using. Like they'll go and look, it's almost like a camera system, right? Hey, you know, somebody's car got stolen. Can I go check the, you know, your camera system? Mm-hmm. They'll retroactively go back, but yep. are they in, you know, on a day-to-day basis or even a continuous basis, are they monitoring all of this? I, I don't think so. Yeah, I, you're probably right. And that's, um, you know, people are getting tools like some SIM or something, and they're not really taking full advantage of it. Like they're probably paying for that ability, but they're not actually utilizing it or not utilizing it well. No, I, I'm going to argue they don't even have it. <laughs> you're saying they're not utilizing it well. I'm going to argue they never even turned it on. They don't have it to turn on. They never even swiped the car. Well. Where's where's Bruce with a stat? I'm sure he'll tell us it's like 99% of people. Uh, it's, don't have... it, it's a much higher number than we all want to talk about just because I just think, you know, comes back to, I hate to say it, right? You say convenience versus security. There's price somewhere in there. Yeah. There, there is 105, 105% of MSPs don't do it. That's what Bruce said. <laughs> I think he might be right. I yeah. think, like, in all, in all fairness, right? Like we thought cloud would have been fully adopted by now. No, it's a hybrid, right? Like it's yeah, never, same there's still situation. a lot of non-cloud systems out there. And I, some would argue that the cloud has become less reliable than they wanted it to be to begin with, right? So, you know, unfortunately when you say we're behind, yeah, as, a, as an industry, as the MSP sandbox, yes, 100%, way more than we think. We think everybody's already adopted tools. No, I think that there's still a long way before like, standardization but anyway yeah, for sure mikey how do people find you and uh how do people go and look to uh get more information on your program uh you can look me up on social media road to CISO, c-i-s-o uh, most social media platforms our website is uh, dnsfilter.com come check us out come say hey join our partner program and i'll be your guide awesome talk to you out there in in the wild my friend thanks for jumping on this session was recorded it's going to be online. You can rewind and like catch Mikey's words and make sure that he was, uh, you know, he was on it. I'm sure he'll back his story up, but um, we'll have this on MSPinitiative.com under sessions. And we'll keep doing these Tuesdays and Thursdays, one o'clock Eastern time or 24 hours a day online. Thanks a lot, my friend. Talk soon. Appreciate it.